Hello, lover friends, and happy Thanksgiving to everybody celebrating today. And we are also going to celebrate some new features to the framework, like the new number helper, a hex validation rule, and new assertion to test against batches inside of job chains. Let's go. When Taylor asked on Twitter about this new PR and what people think about it, even he was surprised by the feedback and over 2000 likes he got, which is even a lot for Taylor. So I think it's a good idea to take a look at this new favorite feature of the community together. We're here inside an application called Tinkerwell. On the left, you can see my code and on the right, you can see the output. And I'm currently using here in level 10.33 version, which supports the new number helper. So currently it just shows the number here on the right, which is just the same number. But now with our new number helper, we can do a bunch of things. So let's start by using the format method here. And let's just use our number and just refresh. And on the right, you can see that now our number has been formatted. That's what it looks by default. We can also add some precisions here. So for the end, we now also see the zeros at the end. And what we can also do, which is pretty cool, we can add a local here. So let's take a look what this looks like in Germany. And as you can see here, the format looks a little bit different. That's also why we here in Austria and German always have difficulties reading numbers, which comes from the US. But it's really nice how this can be done now with the new format method. But there is much more. Let's take a look at another method called for humans. We take our number here again, and you can see that we got 13 million here. So this is a really nice way to get this for human output of a number. And of course, we also have some few things here that we can do. Let's try again, adding another property for the precision. And we now can see actually it's 12.76 million we have here. So we can here be a little bit more concrete. Oh, let's also try with four here. And yeah, you can see we have 12. 7568 million here to be exact. So that's something that I have already used in many of my applications where I want to show to the users a specific number in a very human friendly way. And yeah, we now got this nice helper to do exactly this for us. But there is also some more. Let's check out another method. This one is called currency. And I'm pretty sure you already know what this does here. So it shows my number with a currency which by default is in dollars. But of course, I can also define other currencies, like for example, I'm using euros and you can see what this looks like in euros. And two more I got here for you to show, there is also file size. So we're taking our number again and what we have here are 12 megabytes. So which assumes our input is in bytes. And of course, we can also be a little bit more precise here. 12.166 megabytes. And one more thing I got for you, which is called percentage. So I guess this doesn't work that well with our number because we now got 12 million percentage. So let's go down here to let's say 22. And you can see this is 22%. So this is very useful if you want to show a percentage. Thank you, Kayon, for this new feature. And I'm pretty sure a lot of us are going to use this now every day. Next, we're going to take a look at a new validation rule for hex colors. So we're here again in Tinkerwell and here have a little example. We have our input array, which has a key of color. And then we have our color defined. And then we have this little validator making sure that we validate our input. We want to make sure that color is a string. So this is how I would have done it before this new release. And on the right, if we run this, you can see that our color has passed through the validator and we have here the value. But now with this new addition, we can do something else. Of course, this is a string, but of course, if I change this to something else, this would still pass and this is for sure not a real color. So what we can do is now change this to hex color. Let's run this again, it's still working, but if I try to add any string here, you can see that now it is failing because this is not a real hex color. So this is pretty handy now if you want to store those colors inside your database. And this also supports the alpha channel for hex colors, which are two more ditches from zero till F, I believe. 
not tried. F, so GG should not work. And it does not. So yeah, you can also define the alpha channel for your hex color like that. And I really like how this is working now. Thank you, Nico, for that handy new validation rule. The last time I showed you how you can use job badges inside job chains. Taylor and I also provided a nice assertion to test against this. We're here inside the example from last week's episode where we introduced that we can now use batches which are inside chains. And now with this new addition, we can also test against this. So again, we have here a comment that's a release podcast comment, which we want to test. And that is the chain which we want to dispatch. So I have already prepared a test. We want to make sure that we release our podcast with the right jobs. We are first faking our bus. That's the first thing that we do. Then we're going to run the comment, which I've shown you before. And now we want to run some assertion against this. We're going to start by using bus assert chain method here. And here we're going to provide an array. And the first job which we had, let's take a look together, was the one flush podcast. New flush podcast cache. All right, and then we already had the first batch. And what we can now do, which is now the new assertion which we can use, is called bus chained batch. And here we provide a closure. Inside we have access to the batch. And now inside here we can run some assertions. So if we're going to return something that is true, it will pass. If we're going to return something that is false, it will fail. So the first thing we want to test here, we have access to the jobs. So we can count them. And this should be two because we are having here two jobs inside this batch. Let's run this together, see if this works. And it does not work yet because we have a second chained batch. So this means we also have to provide this now another time because only then the whole test will pass. Let's try again. And it is passing now, proof. All right, so now we have already made sure that we have a specific chain with our flush podcast cache. And then we have two batches. And inside we have just made sure that we have two jobs. Of course, inside here, you can be quite creative and add whatever check you want. So for example, we can also check that, let's say that the first of the job has a podcast ID of one, I believe. Let's check again together. Yes, you're providing one, which will be here, this podcast ID. And this is also what we can test again. So let's run this, this is passing. So this means we can also duplicate this and now let's say the last one should have the ID too. And now I believe this will also pass and it does. And of course you can get very creative here and test against whatever you want. You have access to the jobs, you have access to the public properties, which you can test. You can also test if the instance of the job is a specific one and so on. So I really like that we now have the tools to also test better when we have batches inside chained jobs. Thank you, Taylor. This is also where we're going to end today. Catch you in the next video. Bye.